Welcome everybody. We will be beginning the webinar in a, one minute. Welcome everybody. This is Barbara Sattler. I'm a board member of the Alliance of Nurses for Healthy Environments and I have the pleasure of moderating today's webinar. This is the second webinar, part two, in a series on maternal and child environmental health. Our first one, which is archived on the Alliance of Nurses for Healthy Environments website, um, covered prenatal and perinatal period, also had a wonderful presentation on a tool that was created to assess prenatal exposures to environmental health. And today we're going to focus on children's environmental health. We have two fabulous speakers with us today. I'd like folks to know that um, we will be recording this. So if you found it helpful and wanted to share it with fellow nurses who might not have been able to watch today, we'd be delighted for you to do that. Also, we'll have a period of time after both speakers have gone to do questions and answers. The way we're going to do that, unfortunately, we can't have you ask them out loud, so you'll need to put your questions in the chat. If you look on the top left-hand corner of your screen right now, you'll see attendee chat listed. If you press that, you'll be able to submit your questions. And at the end of the two talks, I'll be moderating and making sure that your questions get answered. Um, if we have too many of them, we'll make sure to get answers to you um, after the program is done. Um, and with that, I'd like to uh, introduce our first speaker. Um, Dr. Laura Anderko is a professor at Georgetown University School of Nursing and Health Studies. And she holds a particular chair there, the Robert and Kathleen Scanlon Endowed Chair in Values-Based Healthcare. She is the co-director of the federally funded Region 3 Pediatric Environmental Health Specialty Unit. And this Mid-Atlantic Health Center, or rather Mid-Atlantic Center for Children's Health and the Environment, serves the states of Pennsylvania, Virginia, West Virginia, Delaware, Maryland, and D.C. Um, it's now shared at Villanova University College of Nursing. Um, and Laura had the uh, distinction of being recognized by the Obama White House as a champion of change for advocacy efforts, efforts in climate change and public health. By the way, the Mid-Atlantic Center provides outreach and education to healthcare providers as well as communities. Um, and serve as consultants and referrals related to both reproductive and children's environmental health. Um, and I'm hoping that Laura will just also describe that there are eight other such centers around the state so that folks know that their states are covered as well. And Laura, I'm simply delighted that you've joined us today. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to you right now. Thanks, Barb. Great introduction, I appreciate that. And uh, thanks to Annie for the invite. Um, yes, uh, we will be talking about the centers briefly across the US. There are uh, 10, one in each of the 10 HHS regions. And um, uh, if you look on our website, you'll see there's a map that shows which, um, which location serves the state where you live. Um, next slide, please. Next slide, thank you. Um, 
Uh, so today we will be talking about environmental exposures uh, that are linked to childhood um, diseases and conditions. Um, this slide um, gives us a not a comprehensive look, but an idea of the range of exposures um, and the range of diseases that um, we have um, a great deal of literature on to date. Uh, and so uh, we know that there are a number of exposures that relate to asthma, um, a number that relate to neurodevelopmental disorders and birth defects, uh, endocrine disorders, and cancer. Uh, again, this is not a comprehensive list, but we will be touching on those exposures that are highlighted in red today. Next slide, please. So environmental exposures are preventable. That's the good news. And throughout the presentation today, we'll be talking about the, the most important intervention, which is preventing exposures. Um, and there are a number of ways that we can do this, um, either through uh, personal behavior change or uh, consumer um, uh, habits that we have, um, as well as advocating for healthier environmental and public health policy. Next slide, please. So um, this slide, I think, takes us to a place, um, sort of bridges um, the webinar from last week, which I attended and was excellent, um, to talk about um, sort of that continuum of health that we see from preconception to um, uh, prenatal and in utero environments um, and how that um, impacts long-term health, um, uh, learning abilities uh, of children. And so, of course, we know that social environment and genetics and nutrition can have a huge impact. Uh, but we also um, know that toxicants um, can be transferred from mom uh, to, to the baby in utero, um, and these can have lifelong impacts. Um, more and more, we're finding that um, some of these exposures can lead uh, to an increase in, for example, ADHD. Uh, and we're continuing to learn more as, as more researchers are focused on uh, the, um, the environment that children are placed in, um, both prenatally and um, as children. Next slide, please. So we're gonna begin with lead, which is um, hopefully most of you have heard about lead and most, most of you are familiar with the health impacts. Uh, because it is so common, um, I thought I would lead off with this um, first. Next slide. We know that lead is um, highly toxic. Um, it poses a serious threat to health in children. Uh, unfortunately, it, it tends to be the number one reason why people call us at the center, um, whether it's in soil or water or or um, in the home, um, it acts as a neurotoxin. And so a lot of the health effects we see really relate to that, um, that organ system being impacted. Next slide, please. So here we have just a, a brief summary of what happens or what can happen um, to a child um, who is exposed to lead. Um, again, a lot depends on the dose, a lot depends on the age of the child and where they are developmentally, um, but um, we, we commonly see damage to the brain and the nervous system, um, oftentimes slow growth and development, uh, learning and behavior problems. We do, uh, when we're working with school nurses and particularly, uh, we like to um, ask them to consider that if a child is misbehaving, um, or has learning problems, um, they may actually have be, be lead poisoned. Uh, and it may not be um, as a result of, uh, you know, a bad home situation or um, other issues. Um, hearing and speech problems can be fairly common. Um, all of these um, lead to uh, or can lead to lower IQs, decreased ability to pay attention in school, underperformance in school with um, an inability to graduate um, and to um, ensure that they have um, uh, employment uh, once they get out of school. Next slide, please. 
So uh, where is the lead coming from, right? Because I said in the beginning, we need to prevent exposures. Well, um, lead's been around for thousands of years. Uh, unfortunately, in this country, it was not banned from uh, residential use in paint until 1978. So any housing that was built before this time most likely has lead in it. Um, we also have lead piping um, in many of our older cities. And um, those pipes that lead from the main water line to the home um, oftentimes are made with lead. So um, water and lead paint dust uh, tend to be the primary sources these days, as well as soil. Um, the center has a, a, a very interesting um, uh, one minute video about lead in soil. Um, and um, for folks with, uh, that live in urban areas with high traffic area or um, have lead paint on the outside of their house, uh, we encourage them to test the soil for lead because that will be picked up um, by uh, fruits and vegetables that are grown, such as tomatoes. And last but not least, the air. Um, we're seeing significant improvements since lead was banned from gasoline decades ago. Uh, but unfortunately, um, it, it sifted from the air into the soil. And so, again, for those communities that are in high traffic areas, um, there is most likely lead in the soil surrounding the home and the playgrounds. Next slide, please. So um, residential exposures tend to be the primary source of exposure by and large um, for the calls that we receive at the center. Um, and again, it's really important to help people understand um, that uh, even if the pain, paint is intact, it can't flake and dust off after time. Uh, you can't see, smell, or taste lead. And so it is um, very often um, it, on toys and um, on window cells, et cetera. Uh, with water, um, we um, encourage people not to use hot water. Uh, if you're going to make a pot of pasta, Make sure that it's, you're using cold water from the, the tap and that you heat it up. Uh, the hot water will leach the lead from the pipes. Um, we also encourage people to let the water run a little bit to make sure that any of that residue from the pipe uh, doesn't go into that pot of water, or that, that glass of, of water that the child will be drinking. Next slide, please. So one of the things that um, we also have been very involved with is um, uh, immigrant and refugee populations who bring with them um, handmade pottery, beautiful pottery, um, which unfortunately um, may have lead in the paint, uh, which can leach into the food. Um, uh, on the left are some of the many treats that contain lead uh, that come from other countries. Um, oftentimes you can buy these in um, dollar stores and other, other um, uh, stores uh, that uh, uh, serve um, uh, uh, international communities. Uh, on the lower right is a baby with a, a very common practice in the Middle East called um, uh, it's, it's uh, makeup to prevent evil eye. And unfortunately, this type of makeup, um, it can be called coal, K-O-H-L or Surma, uh, um, oftentimes has very high levels of lead. And we've seen a lot of lead poison babies because of this, uh, this makeup. Next slide, please. So what do we need to be aware of um, as we're um, practicing and working with communities and families? Of course, we need to assess the risk. What is the housing stock like in that community? Um, what are uh, the cultural habits? Um, uh, uh, within that community and, and that the family may be practicing so that we can help educate uh, and advocate to reduce exposures to lead. Next slide, please. Um, so uh, this kind of summarizes uh, those folks that uh, we need to be particularly focused on, uh, whether they're immigrant, um, refugees, whether parents work with lead, for example, uh, there's lead in batteries if dad's an auto me mechanic, um, if mom is, uh, has a hobby of working on stained, uh, leaded glass stained windows. Um, there are all sorts of hazards in both occupational 
settings and um, those settings where uh, folks are, are have hobbies or or jobs that um, require them to work with uh, with lead. Um, while we conduct our health assessment, and Karen is going to be talking later about some of the tools that are available, we need to include a question on housing. When was that house or a uh, uh, built or um, how old is the apartment that you're living in? Um, lead screening. So um, uh, two times by the age of two is kind of the, the gold standard for Medicaid. Um, while we were working with the D.C. Department of Health, they that, uh, wanted us to help educate physicians and nurse practitioners that at the age of 12 months and 24 months, children really should be screened. Uh, the USPS Task Force came out last year uh, with a disappointing recommendation that um, all children do not need to be screened. Uh, and then uh, that kind of puts the onus on nurses and docs to do a risk assessment for screening. Um, and then finally, just getting involved at the community level um, and letting folks know about available funding if, if their uh, living quarters needs to be remediated uh, through HUD. And um, there are a number of childhood lead poisoning prevention programs in many local communities. Next slide, please. So what is the acceptable blood level for children? None. Um, the CDC has it set at five um, micrograms. However, uh, there's a lot of research that shows that even at much smaller amounts that children, children's health is impacted. Uh, and so um, it is difficult to get levels uh, below five at times. Um, and the CDC is sticking with its guns on the five micrograms right now, but uh, there is no safe level of lead um, when we think about the long-term health impacts on children. Next slide, please. Um, so what are some of the simple things that people can do? Um, the, there are lots of different brands of water pitchers that will take out about 99.9% .9 of lead. Um, also faucet uh, uh, filters, um, more expensive um, and out of reach for some families. Um, are the um, whole house or the under under sink filters, which will take out way more uh, pollutants. Um, uh, but um, the pitchers you can buy for about twenty or thirty dollars, as well as the the faucet filters, and uh, they do a great job in getting out the lead. Next slide, please. Um, nutritional interventions. Um, particularly for kids that we suspect are being exposed to lead and um, uh, because of where they live. Um, there there uh, needs to be an adequate consumption of iron and calcium. Uh, calcium will bind to that lead and help flush it out. Um, avoiding consumption of foods with high fat content uh, is also important. Uh, there's a great little booklet that's free online you can get through epa.gov called Fight Lead Poisoning with a Healthy Diet. And it contains all sorts of great little recipes that you can make for kids that will also help, um, help particularly if they're in at-risk situations for lead. Next slide, please. Uh, personal behaviors. Um, imported ceramics. Um, I actually bought something from Pier 1 a few years ago. And I noticed it said, do not use to, uh, for food. And I checked it out and sure enough, it had lead in it. So um, imported ceramics or ceramics of unknown origin, you should really check before you start putting food in it. Um, cosmetics, there are a lot of cosmetics even here in the U.S. that have lead, such as red lipstick. Um, lead is great. Um, it's cheap and it makes colors pop. So it's used extensively in all sorts of products. Um, Avoid the use of alternative medicines if you're unsure or the community or the family is unsure what's in it. Uh, we talked about international food products such as candy, but also um, leaded uh, cans that have uh, lead solder. Um, many from Italy are still um, uh, soldered with uh, lead um, to hold it together. Uh, those can of tomatoes will leach that lead out in a minute. And always clean and remove shoes before entering the house. This goes not just for lead, but for all sorts of contaminants that are on the grass and on the streets. 
Uh, you track that on the carpet fibers and it can last from 40 to 50 years depending on the contaminant. Next slide, please. So um, we need to ask families to get their homes tested for lead. Uh, at our center when we have events, we do distribute these to families for free. Uh, two of those little swabs cost about $10 at any large box store um, or hardware store. Um, you snap it in half. Uh, there's a little clear liquid that comes out of the tip and you rub it on a plate or on the wall. And if it turns red, then it means that there is lead in that product. Um, also, to keep in mind that if, as moms are getting ready to have that baby, they may be remodeling um, a room into a nursery. Really important to check to make sure that paint does not have lead in it. Um, lots of instances where babies have become lead poisoned when they came home from the hospital as a result of lead dust in, in the nursery. Next slide, please. Last slide for lead um, is to keep in mind the CDC back in 2015 um, uh, made it um, legal for children who were diagnosed as being lead poisoned to be eligible for the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, or IDEA. This means that children can be evaluated in the school system, receive special education if they need it at no charge, and they've shown, it has shown that it greatly increases the child's ability to succeed in school. Next slide, please. So now we move into mercury. Uh, next slide, please. And mercury as well is a neurotoxin. Uh, it's uh, highly toxic and, um, again, also poses a serious threat to children's health. Next slide. Uh, this became popular, wow, probably 20 years now as people were, more and more people were eating fish um, as an important source of protein uh, and omega-3 fatty acids. Um, I happened to be working in the state of Wisconsin at U UWM at the time, and um, there was working with the state health department uh, with hair sampling because fish was fishing was very is still very popular in the state, and they were quite concerned about the levels of methylmercury in uh, individuals. Next slide, please. Um, so this this shows bioaccumulation. Uh, which can happen with methylmercury, and the primary source of methylmercury is coal-fired plants. Um, so as the coal is um, burned, as it combusts, uh, the plume that we see in the top of the slide here um, floats through the air and gets converted to methylmercury, uh, which is the toxic form of it. Um, it can also get methylated um, by plankton and other sea life, uh, small sea life as it drops into the water. Uh, what happens then is that the small fish and the bigger fish um, consume this methylmercury um, and um, it goes up the food chain uh, until uh, grandpa catches the big one, uh, which unfortunately oftentimes has uh, large amounts of methylmercury in it, depending on the fish. Next slide, please. Why is this important for kids? Well, Methylmercury, um, whether it's a low dose prenatal exposure or whether a child has gotten it from um, eating fish, can affect the neurological system. So there's all sorts of um, uh, uh, fine motor function, language, verbal memory, um, and men possibly mental retardation if the levels are high enough that can occur, um, as well as cerebral palsy, deafness, and blindness. Um, next slide, please. Uh, we had at our center um, several years ago now um, a family that called with twins, a boy and a girl. Uh, they were two years old, no, three years old. The, the boy was speaking, but the girl hadn't started speaking yet. Um, and they wondered if it had something to do with the little girl's diet because she was picky and she would only eat tuna. Um, and um, she was eating tuna several times a day. Um, unfortunately, um, they, the parents had her tested. Her levels were very high, uh, and um, 
there were interventions, but she was permanently um, disabled as a result of the consumption of the tuna. Um, EPA um, has a standard um, that's published that if a 45-pound child eats six ounces of albacore tuna a week, the child will have consumed 3.7 times the allowable dose. Um, the reason why I'm really underscoring this is because a few years ago, FDA and EPA put out a, an updated message um, about the importance of pregnant moms um, eating fish during pregnancy, in fact, stating that moms should eat at least eight ounces a week uh, without a clear directive on what kinds of fish to eat. Um, we do know that um, this can transfer to the baby. We know this from a tragedy called Minamata Bay many, many years ago. Um, but there was pressure from the fisheries industry and other uh, corporate groups and um, there was a drop in tuna consumption as a result of nurses and docs um, counseling pregnant moms to reduce their, their fish intake. And so um, unfortunately, there's a lot of confusing messages out right now. Uh, next slide, please. Um, a reputable um, place to look at um, levels of mercury in fish is nrdc.org slash mercury. Uh, this is a little wallet card that you can print out and stick in your wallet. Uh, it will tell you uh, not only the fish that have the least amount of mercury, but the highest. Um, you will note that uh, tuna is listed under high mercury um, and highest mercury. Unfortunately, the list that EPA and FDA offer suggests that tuna is just fine. Um, the... Uh, the thing to keep in mind with the fish intake is, first of all, it's the type of fish. So when you have like a swordfish, which is really should never be eaten, you can say, see, it says avoid eating. Um, they eat other fish. And so when they consume the fish, they're consuming their methylmercury and it bioaccumulates in their system. And so um, the type of fish is very, very important. Um, However, even if you're eating a small fish, right, or one that is less likely to have high levels of mercury, um, if you're eating a lot of it, it bioaccumulates. Remember that in our muscle tissue. So uh, we had a, a fella in uh, Wisconsin who had the highest level of methylmercury in his hair. He was eating bluegill, but he was eating 50 a week. So that bioaccumulated in his system. And also how often you eat the fish, right? So if you're eating it every day, um, that's going to make a difference than if, if you're eating fish once a month. Um, here are links to two resources if you're interested in learning more about this. Um, I would encourage you to explore this, um, particularly if you're working with communities and families um, uh, that consume large amounts of fish. Next slide, please. Health effects of pesticides. Next slide. So um, we know, based on these um, signs, that uh, pesticides can carry warnings, right? Pesticide means it kills pests. It kills all pests. It doesn't say, oh, I'm going to just kill this roach. It says I'm going to kill all pests, including bees and butterflies. Um, and it can be very, very toxic, particularly to children. Next slide, please. Um, there's a whole range of health impacts that can occur as a result of pesticide exposure. Um, it is not uncommon for children playing in one yard who are exposed to um, a service, a spraying service, uh, and it blows over where they have um, minor to severe health impacts. I've spoken to moms whose kids are permanently disabled as a result of somebody getting their lawn sprayed next door. Um, so keep in mind that pesticides um, uh, have a wide range of outcomes depending on the type of pesticide and the amount. Um, it can range from affecting the nervous system to irritating the skin or eyes. Um, some are carcinogens. Some can affect the hormones and endocrine systems. Um, it uh, can trigger asthma attacks. Um, it's, um, 
it really um, is used a lot. And most people are not making the connection that um, that rash on their ankle or that asthma attack was triggered by pesticides. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Hmm. You seem to be having problems uh, getting that slide to keep going. There we go. Thank you. Um, so what is, what is a, a safer way to um, uh, get rid of those pests? Um, there's something called integrated pest management where we can dry them out, right? Um, bugs need water to survive. Oftentimes we'll find them under our sink. Uh, so reduce the sources of water, starve them out, reduce the sources of food, crumbs on the countertop or popcorn on the floor, um, get rid of the sources of food, keep them out, reduce access and shelter. Uh, I had ants coming into my kitchen a couple of weeks ago with change in weather, and I just followed the trail and figured out where they were coming in and just plugged it up. Um, and always use the least amount of toxic pesticides um, if you have to. Follow the label, but by all means, um, try, try these other methods before you use pesticides. Next slide, please. Um, this is the last uh, exposure that we'll be dealing with or talking about today. Um, it's perfluoral alkyl substances. You may have heard about it through some popular films that have been out, Dark Waters and The Devil We Know, which you can see on uh, any streaming um, uh, system. Next slide, please. And uh, it is widespread. Um, the NHANES National uh, survey that is conducted by the federal government shows that almost all of us, over 98% of us, have PFAS in our system. Um, it is everywhere, and I'll show you why in a minute. Next slide, please. Um, there are over 2,000 chemicals within the family of perfluoral alkyl substances. Only a few of them have been tested for human health impacts, but what we're finding is uh, quite concerning, especially for children. Next slide, please. Um, this family of chemicals is important because, as I said, there is widespread exposure. It can affect the developing fetus and child. Um, it can increase cancer risk. Um, there is a long half-life in humans for some of these over 30 years. So once you get exposed, it's in your body for 30 years before your body can get rid of it. Um, it also, as methylmercury, can bioaccumulate in, in uh, your system. And many drinking water uh, systems within the U.S. Um, have PFAS levels that exceed what the EPA calls the Lifetime Health Advisory Recommendation. EPA has not regulated it at all. And so um, what water sanitation companies are doing is just using this lifetime health advisory to be able to um, determine if their water is, quote, within safe um, uh, levels or not. Next slide, please. Uh, so where is the PFAS coming from? The PFAS is coming from a number of consumer products as well as manufacturing facilities. Um, and so um, there are photographs of all of the ways that we might get exposed through stain resistant carpeting, water resistant clothing, um, firefighting foam, which is used extensively on military bases, uh, the um, nonstick cookware, um, uh, the uh, grease free packaging for fast food. Uh, these are long carbon chain chemicals and they're resistant to these, um, these um, exposures, such as um, stains and, and water, and so they're used extensively in consumer products. Uh, because it does get into the water, um, there is a lot of concern about drinking water in PFAS, um, as well as fish that um, people catch in PFAS-contaminated water. Finally, um, it does get passed through the breast milk. It is found in cord blood, um, and uh, the, the, the jury is still out. The research is still being done to see what this does 
to children long term. But we have some emerging research I'll share in just a minute. Next slide, please. Um, for children, the most sensitive endpoints include immunotoxicity and developmental toxicity. Um, the immune system is suppressed with this particular chemical family. Um, there are concerns and a lot of research going on related to um, uh, the effectiveness of immunizations when children get them and they have um, uh, significant levels of PFAS in their body and also developmental tox uh, toxicity over lo a long period of time. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, we also know um, with strong uh, findings that uh, preeclampsia or high blood pressure occurs when moms have um, levels of PFAS in their systems, um, as well as um, um, increased risk for prematurity uh, and low birth weight babies. Next slide, please. So uh, what, are, what, what should we be doing in our practice? Um, again, assessing risk, preventing exposures through education and advocacy is the way to go. Next slide, please. Um, there is medical testing for PFAS. We get this question a lot at the center. It's very expensive. It's not often covered by insurance. And next slide, please. Um, there's not a lot we can tell. Um, whether we get a blood test or a urine test, it will tell us what our level is, but it won't tell us if we're, we're more likely to get cancer or developmental problems. Um, we just don't know. And um, the CDC ATSCR is currently screening families around military bases to, to find out the answer to those questions. Next slide, please. So how do we help families reduce exposures? Again, drinking water filters, but this time the pitchers are not going to do the job. The water pitchers, uh, we need to look at granular activated carbon filters or reverse osmosis, uh, which will take out those nanoparticle um, particles in the chemical chain. Um, if mom is feeding baby formula, not to use PFAS water, uh, but to use pre-mixed formula. Um, controlling dust in the home, stain guarded, uh, uh, stain resistant carpet will flake as well as jackets and furniture. Um, check your local fish advisories to see if PFAS is in the water. Um, avoid those pesky consumer products we talked about earlier and test your garden soil. Um, if you have PFAS in the water and you're, you're planting fruits and vegetables uh, that gets taken up by the plant as well. Next slide, please. So the final message is to prevent exposure so that we can raise healthy, happy children. Uh, and I thank you. Thank you so much, Laura. Um, for people who haven't done any uh, environmental health in the past, uh, um, we're going to be passing out the anti-anxiety medications at the end of the session. <laughs> right? Oh my God, so true. And so I, I know this is a lot and, um, and it's a lot to take in. What I want everybody to be doing though is thinking as a nurse now, how do we begin to take this information? And Karen's going to be talking about how we do assessments. How, what do we do when we know that there's an exposure in our community um, or in a child? Um, what, what do we tell the parent? What kinds of things are going to be helpful? And I think that Laura articulated a number of things that we can do. The question is, how do we institutionalize these answers and make sure that as many nurses and other health professionals know this information. And so next we have Karen Bizdak, a friend and colleague who I'm delighted to be working with. Um, she just became part of the leadership council for Annie in California. And for any of you who are in California who would like to expressly be working with those of us in California, just throw your... Um, email and uh, name into the chat and just say California and we'll grab you up um, after this. So Karen is a clinical professor emeritus 
uh, Emerita at the University of California in San Francisco at the School of Nursing. She was the immediate past director of the Pediatric Nurse Practitioner Program. And she completed her PhD at UCSF um, in nursing and health policy, and she's had a long-term interest in health policy. Her research focused on access to care, particularly for low-income children. And in clinical practice at the Children's Health Center at Zuckerberg, San Francisco General, she cared for urban Latinx population of children and families. Um, she's, a fa she's a founding member of ANI and has served on the steering committee and the policy and advocacy, advocacy committee working on, um, on these kinds of issues, on these chemical policies, and she's continuing to do that too. She's presented and published on a wide range of these issues um, and is interested in access to care and the impact of a childhood overweight and obesity uh, on the healthcare system and the impact of chemical policies on children's health. Uh, in the past, she's worked on tobacco policy um, and particularly its impact on youth. And so with that, Karen, thank you so much for joining us today. And um, what I'd like to just suggest before I turn the mic over to you is that um, for our attendees, please um, include your questions that you might have now for Laura's presentation, as well as ongoing questions that you may have for Karen in the chat so I can take a peek at them so I can moderate the Q&A. Thank you so, so much, really appreciate it. And um, Karen, you're on. Thank you, thank you, Barb, and thank you to Annie for inviting me to speak. Uh, Laura gave great overview, it was a great uh, great start to the webinar, um, of the, really of the, of the current risk to children and families, and also just in contributing, uh, contributing, I wanted to thank or contribute to my part of the presentation. So I am going to talk about the um, current pediatric clinical assessment tools, and there are many of them for clinicians. And they're here to really assess you and the families to identify risks in both their indoor and outdoor environments. So I think the, one of the important points that Laura made was, you know, environmental exposures are preventable. And I think uh, with something like PFAS, um, preventing your amount of exposure that we know of, that were, are known exposures is really important. So, uh, so uh, next slide, please. Thank you, Sarah. So just quickly, we'll be talk, reviewing environmental health exposures linked to clinical assessments, uh, then analyze current environmental health assessment tools for, for pediatrics, and really evaluate those areas of increased vulnerability for children across settings and the areas that we can uh, prevent some exposures. Next slide. <clears throat> so I won't take a lot of time to go over this uh, because Laura gave a very good overview, but definitely the environmental assessment tool screened for exposure to, effectively screen for exposure to environmental tobacco smoke, uh, pesticides for outdoor air pollutants, uh, mold, lead, as Laura talked about, uh, and mercury. And again, the really the only one on this list uh, that we biomonitor for is lead. And even some of those children in the clinical setting at uh, year one and year two will not be formally screened, but may have a screening tool. And we found across settings that they really need to be screened because it's a very subtle and insidious um, increase in lead in some children and it should be identified by biomonitoring. In, in looking at the tools, I really feel they don't effectively screen for exposure to certainly for PFOS. And Laura gave a good overview of that. Uh, as well as bisphenol A, many of you are already aware of bisphenol A in, in plastics and are using BPA-free um, containers for your families or for your own uses and also BPA-free water bottles. The phthalates are not um, effectively screened for, and that's in plasticizers and all the things that we use across, across settings, particularly um, hospital settings. And then outdoor air pollutants, as I did have it on the, the um, exposure list because we certainly do ask about that, but we don't specifically screen for particular particulate matter. And that's one of the things that we know increases asthma in children, uh, certainly, or ozone or sulfur dioxide. Next slide. So this is one of the, the broadly used tools for children and adults. And it was uh, developed at the University of Maryland uh, with the cooperation and collaboration of Annie. And it's been used in clinical settings for a number of years. And it is a very uh, excellent overview. And if you haven't yet done screening either personally or have not been screened by your provider for uh, risks in the home, this is very effective. So it goes over um, 
it, within the home, it, when the home was built, as Laura mentioned, a variety of other things in terms of radon in the basement. Uh, that's more common in some parts of the country with, um, with particularly the East Coast than it is in California, but it's certainly available across all, uh, uh, risk across all states. The other is indoor. You'll see the wood stove, fireplace, uh, how the uh, stove is vented. And then certainly water, it does screen for water. And many in Northern California, where, we're, uh, where we live, do, are still on well water and certainly other parts of the country, particularly rural parts. Next slide. Further, it screens for pesticides, both in the home and in the, the yard area. Uh, for cleaning products, and, and this is uh, known to some individuals, but many individuals uh, continue to use high-risk cleaning products in the home. And certainly with COVID, we've had a lot of information about cleaning surfaces, and uh, there's information uh, coming up about the, the, the best products to use for that. Uh, Food, um, fish, uh, Laura talked about, and definitely the screens overall for food and, and also um, organophosphates and on fruits and vegetables. If someone doesn't use a high number of organic fruits and vegetables or they are not available or affordable in where they live, then certainly uh, that can also be a risk. Um, mercury thermometers, which we rarely have these days, and the mercury is uh, more in food sources, as Laura's mentioned. And then uh, tobacco smoke, and often we do screen for that across settings. Next slide. This is one app that I found that I thought was very interesting. Uh, Laura actually recommended it to me. It's if you have your phone available and you have a moment, just go to the your app store, whether it's on uh, your um, smartphone or your uh, your iPhone, and download. It's very quick. It's under the Department of Housing and Urban Development. But if you just search "Healthy Home Basics," it's really actually a, a fun and uh, easily available on your phone. It has four different settings and it does go through the uh, different things that you should screen. It really makes a phone app into the, the previous tool that I presented. And I think what's interesting about this is that it actually um, does have a quiz. And so if you do download it, uh, it would actually be a good quiz for some of the material that we've covered today and what your individual risks are. And then this can easily, everyone has a phone across income levels and, and socioeconomic status. And uh, I'm not sure it's available in other languages. That was the one drawback I wanted to mention. It seemed to be primarily in English, but if anyone uh, does see it in other languages, please put that in the chat for me. Um, the, uh, the other point, it did seem to be geared more towards middle income and higher income families who are homeowners. But regardless of that, I felt that it could be um, a very uh, usable uh, app across, um, across socioeconomic status and income of families and communities. So check it out and I think you'll find it very interesting. Next slide, please. The New York State Prescriptions for Prevention. This was a very well done site uh, and also Laura tipped me off about this. I had not used it previously, but it actually goes into very specific advocacy and action plans for individuals and families. And many times you do the assessments, but you don't have really highly available action plans right at your fingertips. So um, next slide, please. What you'll see once you, uh, you go into this, and it's very easily searchable, but also I have the, the URLs on each one of the slides. And in there, there's a, a block of different, uh, there's probably about 20 different blocks in this. And you just push on each one. This, this example I have here, is green cleaning, lead paint, indoor air, and mold. So you push on those, and what pops up is really an, an excellent action plan for uh, for families and, and impact the, the health of children and families, and uh, and also for the patients that you care for. So I would take a look at this. I think in the in the green cleaning, it has uh, some quick information. Certainly, it has. You can see the all-purpose household cleaner, and this has been very effective. I. <clears throat> excuse me, please, and seen this in a lot of the COVID information about making your own uh, cleaners. Uh, it talks about using bleach rather than other high-level chemical uh, uh, sprays to clean surfaces. Um, and it, it also uh, gives you information about um, killing germs at the household surfaces. So this is just one example, but if you please do download it, it it's very usable and, and uh, actually would work well on your phone as well. So you can go in and look at all the different areas and it's a good check for you in your own home and then you can apply it to your nursing practice. Next slide, please. 
This is the Children's Environmental Health Network uh, site, and there are screening tools available on this site, but I have to say, after looking at all the screening tools, what I felt was really excellent on this site were the uh, childhood resources. And here you can see I have listed the pre-K resources, but actually it has very good resources through, uh, through high school. And uh, so it's very age, age appropriate. And particularly now with our online learning with COVID, many parents are, are really looking for a variety of different things to, um, for children's learning and also teachers. And so take a look at this because I think you would find that it would be very helpful for home learning for K through four or five through eight, and perhaps even uh, to activate advocacy in, in high school students. Uh, and avail available then uh, again very easily on children's uh, on the children um, environmental health network site. Next slide. This is also uh, it's actually uh, you can also get it through the children's environmental health uh, network site. But there's actually another site, and you can see the URL here. That's the National um, Environmental Educational Foundation site. Uh, it's very searchable, and I found that these. Um, these particular questionnaires are a little more sophisticated um, than the initial screening, but the initial screening uh, that I talked about um, from University of Maryland certainly uh, you should be used because many times they're so busy in a clinical setting that you don't have time for a very sophisticated um, questionnaire. This would be good for parents uh, to do in outpatient settings when they're in the waiting room or for uh, patients who might be in specialty and you're concerned about some type of risk of exposure. Uh, I gave the particular example here of uh, food and water contamination and also toxic chemical exposures and it goes into very specific questions and so if you had a patient that was literate and you could screen them this is a very good way to get a good sense of what their risk of exposures might be so uh, also take a look at this because it uh, it goes into every area that Laura talked about next slide this is actually I did put this on the list although it's not just pediatric focused but for those of you who um, are developing an interest in environmental health and and you actually really want to look further uh, at how you might integrate this e either into an educational setting that you're involved in or in your patient care setting. This has a number of really interesting case studies. They are adult-based, and it is more based on occupational health. Uh, but I do think what's what I found most interesting about this site, um, and this is the Agency for Toxic um, for Toxic Substances, and you will see it there uh, in dis Disease Registry. And this... Uh, the, the case studies are, are really excellent. Again, adult up, um, adult applied and uh, for occupational health, but it actually uses in the differential exposures or risk of exposure. And I think this is the one thing across pediatric settings that we should perhaps consider beginning to look at as nurses to really put in our mind if we're working with patients and families across settings, whether it's inpatient or outpatient or in home health. Um, I really do think that we should consider risk of exposures indoor and outdoor in the setting that our children and families are in that we're working with. And if we put this on every differential, I think it would become a more routine part of healthcare practice. So if you have time and uh, if you are not zoomed out or haven't done too many webinars, please uh, click into this. It's very easily accessible as atsdrcdc.gov. And, uh, and then just search for case studies in environmental medicine. And there are great examples, and they could be adapted to any pediatric educational uh, setting that you might be involved in, those of you who are on the call. Next slide. So I did want to just make a quick point to finish. We're almost out of time here, but on state surveillance of environmental hazards, we brought up the, the uh, next slide, we brought up the point of assessment versus screening versus biomonitoring. And those are all different approaches to identifying risk of exposure in children. And uh, many states do have biomonitoring, as I mentioned and Laura mentioned, lead is, a, is one, one of the only metals that we do biomonitoring on routinely. And even some children are really don't get that in the setting that they're given care in. It's more common in, in public insurance. Um, families with public insurance, health insurance, and also in federally qualified health centers. Uh, but if you're working in specialty, perhaps even, or some other type of pediatric setting, then um, biomonitoring may be important in terms of risk of exposure. But California, this is particularly from California Department of Public Health, they have a more sophisticated uh, biomonitoring system that they've had in place uh, since 2006. And actually, New York has one, New Mexico has one. So in the state that you're in, go to the California Department of, I'm, I'm sorry, the State Department of Public Health, and 
uh, check out and search biomonitoring because there may have been some legislation specifically in your state, and there may be chemical exposures that are specific to the state or region that you live in that may not be pertinent in some other states, depending on whether it's a rural or urban area. So I found this um, very interesting. It has the list of chemicals at this site that California screens for. And again, biomonitoring just tells um, the state health department what are the possible exposures in different areas. It doesn't yet, and it certainly looks at a, a population that they use for a study population. It doesn't look at the specific um, amount in each individual and what that means. So I think um, environmental exposures are preventable. We have to, at this point, look at assessment in our environments and try to limit exposure because we don't have a sophisticated biomonitoring um, system yet individually uh, in, or in some states or areas as well. Next slide. So I think just the last point is that clinical assessment of exposures is key to creating a healthy environment for children for optimal growth and development. And also as nurses and uh, providers and advanced practice providers, remember to include the assessment of environmental health hazards in all your clinical work across pediatric healthcare settings and in your work with families. And just acknowledgement again to uh, Alliance of Nurses for Healthy Environments for having the webinar and for making this available to you. Thank you. Terrific. Um, that was just wonderful. You're, uh, the one-two punch of Laura and Karen has just been a, a huge amount of wonderful information. Thank you so much. And one of the things I'd like to encourage is for any of you who are working in pediatric settings, and for those of you who are teaching uh, pediatrics, please consider assigning your students to listen to this program. You've got two national experts who just did a terrific job. So now I, um, there are a couple of questions that came in. Um, the first one I'm going to ask Laura to field. Um, and you mentioned about PFAS and immunizations. So if you could please speak a little bit more about that and also a little bit more about neurotoxicity. And given that we have four minutes, um, if there is also an additional um, resource or article uh, that uh, Jamie Damico could look at, um, please add that as well. So, Laura, go ahead. Thanks, Barb, and thanks for the question, Jamie. Um, yes, um, there has been um, a fair amount of research going on related to um, the uptake, if you will, of uh, traditional uh, immunizations such as DPT and MMR for children that have high levels of PFAS. Um, what we're seeing is that the PFAS will suppress the immune system and um, thereby um, uh, changing up how well those immunizations um, are taken up by the child. So um, I am happy to um, I don't know if there's a place to post an article, um, Barb, but uh, there have, I've published a couple articles this year on PFAS. Um, there, uh, there is a 25 page fact sheet that we have for health providers on our website um, that I can share uh, that has all the references and all the detail about uh, neurotoxicity as well as um, immuno. Uh, suppression and toxicity, um, particularly in children as a result of PFAS. Um, there's also a great website, Northeastern University uh, has a um, center dedicated to PFAS. And if you just Google them and do PFAS, um, uh, uh, you'll see their website and they also keep it very current with information around uh, research and, and health effects. And I think what might be helpful, Laura, and for the attendees here is um, we have the attendees' email addresses, and we can send all of them uh, these URLs as well as uh, a link to the actual articles um, as a one-time follow-up to this. And there was another question uh, about... Um, uh, uh, that was about cleaning products. And this is Karen. Could I just speak to that before we close? Please. Yeah. And just to say again, if you go to the, the site that I mentioned that was in your prescription site, 
um, it does have that recipe with Clorox and that there's been good uh, research evidence that, uh, with COVID that the, um, the you know, dilutions of Clorox are the most effective. Of course, Clorox, it does have a lot of gassing out, but, <laughs> um, but dilute, it is effective and it has um, certainly some chemicals, but less than some of the other ones that are recommended. So I would take a look at that and, uh, and also look at that one site because it does have a variety of, um, of different recipes. Uh, the question I think could also be in relation to the vinegar, uh, vinegar lemon, and, and I think that's a good question. I agree with Barb that I don't think there's a, a good evidence on that, but definitely the Clorox product, uh, the Clorox recipes have been effective for COVID, and of course that would disinfect other, other areas as well. Mm -hmm. Good, thank you. Um, and I think I, it would be wonderful briefly to hear uh, from. Uh, let's start with Laura and, and Karen. Certainly, an opportunity to say something. We have we get lots of questions about the methyl mercury that may have been used as preservatives in vaccines. Um, what can you share with nurses? We need to be evidence based on our answers about this. So, Laura, would you mind starting? Sure. So, the ethyl mercury that was brought up by Patrick is actually not considered. Um, toxic uh, and is typically the mercury that is used in um, vaccines. And so there hasn't been, to my knowledge, uh, any evidence to suggest that that type of mercury is problematic um, or toxic um, to children or adults. Um, it's very different than the methyl mercury that we talked about earlier today. And this is Karen, I would agree. Um, and I think we can safely say that uh, the vaccines are methylmercury free. Uh, I work in pediatric settings in primary care and I give, have given many thousands of vaccines. Um, previous, there, there was a concern about that, but certainly has been debunked by a lot of evidence over the past decade. Thank you. And we are uh, going to be faced with having to do a lot of health education around vaccines in this country in this in 2021. So having our facts straight, our messaging clear, uh, it's going to be incredibly important for us as evidence-based professionals. I just want to thank again, uh, I want to thank our attendees for joining us. Mm -hmm. It was a fabulous uh, set of presentations. And um, to my friends and colleagues who presented, once again, thank you for your time. Everybody does this as a volunteer um, and uh, we just really appreciate uh, your presentations today. So thank you again. Thanks for the invite. Thanks, Barb. Yeah, thank you. And with that, we will stop recording now. <laughs>